Welcome to the first episode of Story Mode with Sanlo, where we talk to gaming founders and executives about their careers and personal journeys in the gaming industry. I'm your host, Olya Kalushna, and today I'm thrilled to have with us Sean wiley Toll, CEO and co-founder of Extra Dimension Games. For those of you who are not familiar with Sean and Extra Dimension Games, they're known for mobile titles, Critter Coast, Merge Meadow, and they have a new title, Star Brew Cafe. Um, Sean, let's just jump right into that. Any shameless plug or news that you want to cover? We're all about getting the word out into the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think everyone should should check out our, our latest game, Star Brew Cafe, which is our, our latest take on the on the merge genre. We've been we've been doing merge games since 2018 with with Merge Meadow, our, our first sort of uh, uh, big big hit. And um, you know, we think Star Brew Cafe is a really great evolution for the genre. So. Awesome. And which platforms is it available on today? It's on iOS and Android if you're in uh, the, the, the UK, Canada, or the US. So we're doing our, our English launch. Could you share a little bit about your early days? What led you into the gaming industry and maybe any particular game or gaming experience that sparked your passion in the field? Yeah, I think like most people, I ended up in games sort of by accident. I, I had sort of this, I've always loved games. They've been like a, a fixation for me for, for my entire life. We got we got a, a, an original Nintendo when I was a kid and that, that sort of kicked off this, this journey. And, you know, I'm kind of a shy, introverted kid and not a ton of friends and games are just this great outlet, right? Like there's just these huge worlds to explore and get lost in, so. I think my my favorite game growing up was you know most of the Zelda series, but I think Chrono Trigger was was the one that stands out the most. It's just this all the different endings and the characters, and it was just a really really great world. When I graduated high school, you're supposed to pick what you're supposed to do with the rest of your life, and uh, I had I had no idea, so I, I I didn't go to university. I I taught myself to code, and I ended up joining a startup, and that turned into an opportunity to then co-found a mobile studio in 2004, and that's that's sort of what what got me into this whole thing was pretending to be a CTO. So as a CEO with an engineering background, how do you think that affected and changed your, your journey? I think it helps to, the engineers don't often get a seat at the, at the, the, the product development sort of high, high level C-suite type of table. Um, you know, CTOs are always foundational parts to organizations, but they, they can often be you know, put to the side and often more operational, uh, sort of resigned to the, the tech sphere. But, um, you know, there's a lot of unique uh, vision opportunities that come from understanding how technology works and, and where you can extrapolate it. That not only saves time when you're trying to do projects that don't make any sense, like like shiny new, chasing shiny new buzzword technologies, um, but also gives a really good appreciation for for you know just the data and analysis and, and and logical flow of things. What's the uh, what's the biggest challenge you would say you have had as as again as a CEO with an engineering background? You know, I've I've never really felt like I had to be the smartest person in the room, but there's there's something around the CTO tech nature where there's like this constant path of growth and and understanding that and and growing up without a mentor that 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 can lead people into into that sort of realm so i think a, a really important moment in my development as a as a manager was realizing that i didn't have to be the smartest person in the room my job was more about helping others do their best work and that is something that i try to carry through in my my ceo job now because it's like i don't do anything i don't i'm not responsible for any product or engineering or, or any sort of stuff I, I make decisions and i help guide and i I, I help unblock people and and provide resources, but I, I provide nothing, right? Like I'm I'm I, I I I am not the smartest person in the room, nor nor should I ever be. I, I I strive to find really smart people to surround myself with, and it's a it's it's a different way of thinking, and that's um it's taken it's taken a while to sort of realize how that's supposed to work. Um, I was I was literally speaking with somebody in the morning today, and he told me the job of if any CEO has three things. You drive the vision, uh, you make sure that that the company has money and it can sustain itself and you can have time, and it's the people. It's getting the right people in place and it's retaining your talent. 
on the people side specifically, what what would be your advice or maybe even a like specific tactic which allowed you to get to that state where you don't do anything, but you enable people on your team to do their best possible work and stay happy? Yeah, well, it's, it's grounded in trust for sure, right? Trust trust and also empowering people to to make mistakes because it's it's not trust that they're going to do the right thing all the time but that, that they can figure it out right so it's not like oh you've you screwed up you're fired get out get out of here i don't want to see you again it's like well what what did we learn how are you not going to do this again like performance is is about continual growth right like getting getting better at something um and so when when you're putting a team together, from my experience, you know, more more flat, distributed uh, works very well with startups, too, because like startups are a great place to do something you're completely unqualified for. Right. Find a way to add value. Do it. And if it's outside your job scope, even better. Really, really great people want want that cycle. Right. They, they, they want the challenge. They want the learnings. They look, they're accepting of failure, but they're really driven by, by success and, and progress and growth. Um, so it's important to try to find those, those people wherever possible. Was there a specific challenge that you had to overcome and it felt like a major turning point for you? For me, it's, it's been really important to be, to be open about challenges that I that I have personally um, and, and, in, and in business with with trusted peers like having that group where you can you can just like bear your soul like a lot of a lot of development and corporate cultures are very meritocratic um, so it can make you feel like you're not you're not allowed to make mistakes you're not allowed to have a problem you're not allowed to be stuck like you've got to figure it out and you know that is that is you know, you want to be able to figure that out, but you don't have to do that by yourself. And like admitting that you don't know something and asking a question and, and trying to get clarification and, and direction and, and something to help you is, it can be really, really hard. Um, and I don't know why it's somehow tied up in psychology probably, um, but it's really, it's, it's really uplifting, right? Not, not, it's cathartic to get it out and, and you can actually then have a meaningful conversation afterwards. So you've run a company for, for a few years now. And you probably have had the moments where you had to change the direction or you had to pivot. How, how did you navigate that? How did you communicate that to the team so that they stay with you and you keep that balance of being vulnerable, maintaining the trusting relationship, but yet making sure that people who, who are with you are with you and they will stay with you. It's not something that happens in that minute. The people sticking with you is what happens for the last six months, right? Do, does the team trust you? Do they do they trust each other? Are they is there cohesion? There can give you a lot of frustration. Like there should, this is again, like different people have different opinions, but there should be a lot of arguments, right? Like there there are different opinions every single day, and you should you should fight about it. Don't hold back. Like let's make ourselves better by by hashing out these difficult details. But when a call when a call is made and it's time to move on, it's time to move on. Um, so in terms of like, how do you make sure that the team is cohesive? You've got to make sure that they're there for more than just that product. That's, that's the big thing, right? Are people there? It's more applicable at larger companies, but like, do you, are you, are you in this job for the paycheck? Are you in this for the mission and the vision and, and like one being part of something bigger and, and build things? Like if that, if that is more the drive, then the product is almost irrelevant, right? And if you've got good alignment with, with your peers and you feel respected and you feel like you're able to contribute and add value and learn and grow, then it should be no, no problem. It's just like, Oh yeah, cool. Like what's next? As a, as a leader, as a CEO of a company, how, how do you ensure you're always at the forefront of gaming, especially given how dynamic the industry is and ever changing? Sometimes people overuse that sort of like bleeding edge sort of mentality and they like, jump on the latest technology and they they hope for its disrupting force to carry them through but i don't know i, I started my my career so in 2004 we were doing 3d mobile games if you can believe that i don't know what phone you had in 2004 but i doubt it could run 3d and well, not even blackberry i don't think i'm my phone could <laughs> no, run a 3d game there was, uh, <laughs> there was some phones in in japan and there was a, a mascot there's a jsr 184 spec and it was all very very bleeding edge but you know we had to diversify into 2d and it, it eventually all worked out but you know the, my point is just that the 
the the latest shiniest thing is not the point you're, you're trying to find the best way to reach uh, a ton of people right and the innovation is in understanding cultural changes and and how technology might be in, in enabling that and you know it's to be it's to be 10 steps ahead it's it's really you know it's an overused term but it's to be visionary it's and it's it's to take a take a shot and that that requires talking to a lot of people I, like you do no one person has all that information and everybody has little pieces and you know these these are deeper ideas come from all that information just sort of living in your head over a period of time like a like a rock tumbler or something like that is just sort of rolling around and then things come out and and you've and you've got to experiment and eventually you, you, you've got to have some way to have conviction the this the cto part of me really wants proof a lot of times and it, it's really hard with audience stuff it's basically impossible so you need instead you need conviction and the conviction comes from trust in information and trust in vision and, and trust in the team and stuff like that building building games is very much like building a bridge uh, where you you have to start on both sides at the same time but one, one side is is your vision it's your audience it's it's you know your business goals and strategy and all that sort of stuff it's where you want to end up but then the other side is your execution piece so it's your it's your it's your tactics it's your pillars it's your essence and, and things like that and you've got to meet in the middle but they also move right they move every day and you have to be reactionary and be able to figure that stuff out. So, um, you know, bleeding edges and, and innovative technology is, is a real moving target. And it's, it's important to not get lost in it. You have to know about it and you have to know what's coming and be, be willing to invest the time in figuring out where it might go. Um, but you, you, with new information, you have to change. So what is, what are the, uh, looking back last 12 months, so a lot of things have been happening in the world. Let's call it, it was 18 months, a lot of changes economic, political, social, societal changes. How, how do you think those events have affected and changed your audience? The core of mobile gaming, which is very different than, than other gaming in a lot of ways, is that it is, it is much more of an escape. It's a, it's, a, it's a brief respite from crap, right? Long day, waiting in line, um, you know, terrible, something terrible has happened it's it needs to be an escape and it needs to be that that like that that punchy sort of moment um i think that that's always been true of mobile so that's that's not a new thing i think what's what's uh, what's changed is that that you know people are busier than ever the short the short sessions the ability to invest time and money has has sort of changed so it's more important than ever to be able to have a really succinct condensed experience that makes people feel like they're part of something bigger. What were some of the most defining moments or milestones in your career journey? I, I think this, the thing that really still drives me and, 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 and excites me is, is the, you know, the scale of success that we managed to reach on the Simpsons tapped out. So that was, uh, you know, an amazing game made by an amazing team, but it was, it was a labor of love for sure. It was, it was challenging, challenging game to make and, and, and ship and run and, there's a ton of learnings that happen through that process and and just scaling it afterwards as well. So we were we were acquired partway through development of that game. Um, we we shipped it. Um, it was about about uh, six six eight months after we were acquired, um, and the team that made it was like 15 people. It was it was fairly small, um, and it had a lot of technical issues we had to pull it from the store but we we were able to utilize the the expertise within ea to to fix a lot of those problems on the server side and relaunch it and you know it's been a been a killer ever since but um you know we had to grow the team to it was like over 200 people i think across five geos to support it within 18 months it was just it was just big and it wanted to go and it was it was a real taste of scale that that is just intoxicating right you know seeing people on the bus playing your game and just the the the, the thrill and excitement of, of that many people loving loving what you make is is fantastic looking into the future uh what are the most what are the things that you're most excited about uh for the industry for the gaming industry I, i'm excited to finally move past these these games that that thrive just by targeting whales and 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 survive based on the limited economic opportunities that 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 provides and and really getting to to the like deeper more meaningful experiences 
I think that I grew up with, and that that's always been my my hope with our with our company is to to build these deep deeper casual games. Awesome, Sean. Thank you so much. We'll be back next week for a new episode. Uh, bye for now. Thanks, Thanks for listening. You made it to the end. Congratulations.